Hello and welcome to the second episode of our lecture on systems inquiry. So the topic of the lecture now is embracing complexity. So this lecture on system uh, inquiry started with episode one where we gave some notion, discussed some ideas associated with systems philosophy and systems thinking. And we continue this lecture on one very important aspect of systems thinking which we call complex systems, and finish again as usual the lecture with an interview. In episode two, we, we will cover the following, the concept of complex adaptive systems and the relevance to the study of social ecology systems, social uh, systems of human and nature, as we define in episode one. Then we're going to take a brief look at the attributes of complex adaptive systems and then conclude the episode with a description, a brief description of a general concept of adaptive change. So we first define complex adaptive systems. Second, uh, we look at complex adaptive systems attributes. Then we're going to look at cycles of adaptive change and finish the episode with our conclusions. Now, the, the study of social ecology systems assume that social ecology systems are complex adaptive systems. This perspective is a fast-growing interdisciplinary field of inquiry. The term complex adaptive systems, also referred to as CAS, was coined at the Interdisciplinary Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico by John Holland and Murray Gelman and others in the mid-1980s. So in the mid-1980s, the Santa Fe Institute was formed and many scientists from different fields, different parts of the world were invited to come to further develop the field of complex adaptive systems. Complex adaptive systems are special cases of complex systems. And by complex systems, I mean systems exhibiting one or more properties, not obvious from the properties of the individual parts. They are complex in the sense that they are diverse and made of multiple interconnected elements. And most importantly, they are adaptive in the sense that they have the capacity to change and learn from experience, a term referred usually as self-organization. Most things we take for granted are complex adaptive systems. Things like the brain, our immune system, the cell, the developing embryo, the stock market, uh, ant colonies, ecosystems from very small scale as we saw on lecture three all the way to the entire planet, the ecosphere, Gaia, any human social groups such as communities, institutions, political parties, etc., they are all complex adaptive systems. So therefore, it's very, very important if you have purposes to understand their behavior, their dynamics, it's very important to understand complex adaptive systems theory. So, all complex systems, adaptive systems, share some common attributes. These uh, attributes are important to the, their understanding. One very important characteristic attribute of complex adaptive systems is nonlinearity. Nonlinearity is the case when a small changes in the initial conditions of the system can have significant effects a term usually used to refer to this attribute of complex adaptive systems is the famous butterfly effect. Uh, here in this particular slide, I give you an example of this nonlinearity. is a rolling snowball, for example, gains on each row much more snow than it did on the previous row, and very soon a first-sized si first snowball becomes an avalanche is a great one. And you know in the study of complex systems, chaos theory, they usually like to give an example of the butterfly effect 
which uh, a butterfly flip its wings in South America, for example, can generate a, a hurricane in Florida. Another very, very important attribute of complex adaptive systems is emergence. Emergence is the way unique and novel qualities emerge through the evolution of increasingly complex patterns and processes. The emergent property, the emergent element or entity is unlike its components in so far as it cannot be reduced to the lower levels. The emergent property represents a new level of the system's evolution. And here is a basic theoretic explanation of this saying the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's because of the emergence. As the parts combine and interact among themselves, new qualities, new properties can emerge as a result of that interaction. But that new quality, that emergent property of the system, cannot be reduced to the parts themselves. So anytime, as we explained in the previous episode, because of the nature of the nested, nestedness of the universe, any times a system moves up in the hierarchy, so it adds new properties. It, it, it transcends the, the properties of the parts, the constituent parts, and add new parts. So the system becomes more and more complex as it adds more and more properties in the process of expansion. An emergent behavior or property can appear when individual entities, which in complex adaptive systems language is called agents, operate in an environment forming more complex behavior as a collective. The emergent phenomenon is not a property, as I said, of any single entity, cannot be found as a property of any single entity, nor can it be predicted or deduced from behavior of the lower level entities. I gave an example here in one of our earlier lectures of the molecule of water. And the molecule of water has emergent properties. The molecule of water, as we know well, is the interaction between two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So each atom in itself, they have properties. They have unique properties that characterize them as entities. The hydrogen have a set of characteristic properties as well as the molecule of oxygen. However, when these two combine, they generate a new set of properties which are characteristic of a more embracing system, which is the molecule of water. The, emergent, the emergence happens over thus disparate size when, if, if the emergence happens over different size, different scales, then the, re the reason the, is usually a causal relation across the scales. Emergent structure can be found in many natural phenomena, from the physical to the biological domain. The shape of weather patterns, such as hurricanes, for example, are emer emergent structures. Termite hills, for example, the wondrous pieces of architecture with mazes of interconnecting passages, larger caverns, and ventilation tunnels are also examples of emergent structures. Another important attribute of complex adaptive systems is self-organization. Self-organization is a process where some form of global order or coordination arises out of the local interactions between the components of a system. This process is spontaneous. It is not directed or controlled by any agent or subsystem inside or outside the system. According to systems philosophy, the entire universe is a self-organizing complex structure. So that meaning that all the characteristics and, and growth and evolution is not controlled, is not necessarily controlled by one agent or entity, even inside or outside the system. However, the laws followed by process and it's in, by the process and its initial condition may have been chosen 
or caused by an agent. This has a very, very important uh, application in civic ecology in our process of working with communities. I mentioned here in the first lecture and in, during our interview that when we interview, intervene in a community as a facilitator, most of the time we want to create conditions from which we expect that through a process of self-organization, some new properties or phenomena will emerge. So our role is more in kind of trying to influence, although we, can, we don't necessarily know what are the consequences of that intervention, but we try to create those conditions that may or may not, through a process of self-organization, create a new condition, a new state. It is often, uh, the process of self-organization, it is often triggered by random fluctuations that are amplified by, as we mentioned uh, in the last episode, feedback mechanism, positive feedback mechanism. And whatever is a, a phenomenon is amplified within the systems concept, it always is amplified by a positive feedback mechanism. The result organization is wholly decentralized or over all the, compo all, or over all the components of the system. As such, it is typically very robust and able to survive and self-repair substantial damage or perturbations. Another important attribute of uh, complex adaptive systems is coevolution. All systems exist within their own environment and they are also continuously interacting with that environment. As the environment changes due to external uh, condition, for example, they need to change, the organism, the systems within the system need to change in order to ensure best fit. But because they are part of the environment, when they change, they change the environment again. And as it has changed, they need to change again. And so it goes on a, as a continuous process. So the entities that made up the parts of a system change when the entities change because they interact with the organism, they force the organism to change, and as the organism change, the entities change again. So this is why I mean by coevolution. Uh, I kind of think of it as like a cosmic dance in which the, the pairs try to adapt to the movements of the other. One important attribute of complex adaptive system is what we call requisite variety. The greater the variety, diversity within the system, the stronger it is. And we mentioned this here when we look at uh, the concept of ecological uh, integrity and look at uh, resilience as one of the attributes of ecological integrity. And we mentioned at that time that diversity was a stronger component of a system's integrity or a system's resilience. Ambiguity and paradox abound in complex adaptive system. We also mentioned this here when we look at the concept of resilience. This, uh, they use contradiction, contradictions to create new possibilities to co-evolve co with the environment. Uh, one example that comes to my mind here is democracy. Uh, the strength of democracy is derived from its tolerance and even insistence in having variety of political perspectives. Connectivity, another important attribute of complex adaptive systems, is related to the way in which the agents in a system connect and relate to one another. It's critical to the survival of the system. Patterns are formed and feedback disseminate from these connections. The relationship between the agents are generally more important than the agent themselves. You can think here, you know, for example, of a football, football team. So uh, usually when a team is not uh, doing well, one of the first uh, uh, ideas is to buy new players, to bring in new players, and uh, spend a lot of money to get the best possible players. But remember, the success of the team, although depends uh, on the quality of the player is not necessarily related to the player itself, 
but in the way that the prayer will connect to the other uh, prayers and uh, therefore uh, improve the general performance of the team. Uh, next, we move here to the last part of this episode uh, to discuss a model of complex adaptive change. This model we call the adaptive cycle. And this model was originally conceptualized and proposed by American uh, ecologist Crawford, Stanley Harling. This model uh, is a very, very useful to help us interpret the dynamics of coupled human and natural system, or as we called in the beginning of this lecture, social uh, ecological systems in response to disturbances and change. Here is the model uh, proposed by Harlin, as you see is this uh, uh, eight, has an eight shape, shape horizontal eight. And uh, this uh, model attempts to ex explain the dynamics of complex system, complex adaptive system. And it has been described as a cycle made up four phases. And it, it is explained as moving slowly from what they call uh, the exploitation phase, which is the R phase, moving slowly to what is called the conservation or, or K phase, then maintaining or collapsing to a third phase, omega phase, or the release phase, continue, so that from the movement in the back loop from alpha, from omega to alpha, from the, from the release to the reorganizing, uh, to, the, um, to the organizing phase is very fast as opposed to the front loop from the exploitation to conservation, which is very slow. So it moves very fast. So what he's trying to say here is that all complex adapt adaptive systems, as we, as we mentioned here, all living systems are complex adaptive systems. They behave that way. This is how they evolve, how they renew themselves, how they collapse, how they change. You can imagine it starting in this R phase, you know, in a phase of exploitation, then slowly it moves to a state of maturity, which he calls conservation, a very stable uh, condition. And then if, if, if the system does not develop adaptive capacity mechanism to uh, cope with uh, disturbances, long, uh, external or internal disturbance, the system can break down, can collapse. Once that system collapses, it can release all the resources that they had under control, and that give an opportunity for opportunists to move in and use that resources to reshape and renew the system. A good example of this four, this four phases can be given through, for example, a spruce fir, fir, fir forest. The growth or exploitation phase, or the R phase, can be understood as the early stages of ecological succession. So the, the community starts developing. Then, uh, throughout, in a very slow process uh, throughout time, they move to what is called the conservation or accumulation phase, the K phase, what is by ecologists called the climax community. At that point, we have a mature forest. That forest controls all the resources by protecting, you know, by high, uh, uh, covering the surface with its canopy. It minimizes the penetration of light to other uh, plant species that are on the ground and therefore take the opportunity, remove the opportunity from, for, their, for them to, to grow and compete. However, this system, although uh, tightly coupled and have full control of the resources, this system can collapse due to things, for example, a forest fire, fire or a pest outbreak. In the presence of a forest fire, most of the resources that were held in the trees are released into the soils. And as those resources are released into the soils, so we move to a new phase, a phase of reorganization or renewal in which soil processes make nutrients available to new plant species that will uh, uh, compete and promote a renewal of the forest. I want you to notice in the figure there that there is a little tail moving out of the cycle. 
and I want to tell you what, what that means. That means a loss of resources. This cycle is more or less happening within a given context, but a loss of resources can be detrimental to the system and cause the impoverishment of that system. In the case of this forest here, that loss of resource could be exemplified by a torrential rain following immediately uh, a fire. During the fire, as I mentioned uh, before, all the resources are uh, released into the ashes, into the, the soil, to be available to uh, new competitors. However, with the occurrence of a rainfall, all that those nutrients can be removed from the area through the process of runoff, and that means a loss of resources to that system. As you can see in the cycle uh, presented by Holland to describe adaptive change, the two main dimensions that determine the change in an adaptive cycle are connectedness and potential. This is very important. The connectedness dimension, which is represented, represented here in the horizontal axis, it stands for a system's ability to internally control its own destiny. As you can see in the diagram, maximum connectivity happens at the K phase, where the system reaches a mature state and has the ability to internally control its own destiny. According to Gunderson Howlin, the connectedness dimension reflects the strength of internal connections that mediate and regulate the influence between inside processes and the outside world. The other important dimension, which is represented in the vertical axis, is the potential dimension. The potential dimension stands for the inherent potential of a system that is available for change. Social or cultural potential can be characterized by the accumulated networks of relationships friendship, mutual respect, and trust among people and between people and institutions of governance, according to, again, Gunderson and Howley. So in summary, I wanted to look at this figure, the potential in the vertical axis in the, horizon, or in the connectedness on the, ax, on the horizontal axis. And we can see, again, compare the two with respect to the front and back loop. In the front loop, what we, what we have is connectivity, connectedness, and potential move in the same direction. When we move from the exploitation phase to the accumulation phase, both potential and connectedness increases. So at the K phase, the system has great connectedness, and at the same time, great potential for change. When we look at the back loop, they go in different directions. As the system moves from omega to alpha, connectedness declines. The system, remember what I mentioned that in the, the release phase, the resources are released, so there is no internal control by the system. So therefore, connectedness declines dramatically. But as the system moves rapidly from the omega to the alpha phase, the potential for uh, renewal, for change, increases dramatically because that creates new opportunities for competitors, new species to come in and, and take the resources. According to the adaptive cycle concept, the levels of both dimensions differ during the course of the cycle, as I said. The adaptive cycle does predict that the four phases of the cycle can be distinguished based on distinct combinations of high or low potential connectedness. R has low, the R phase has low connectedness, low potential, the K phase has high connectedness, high potential. Omega phase has high connectedness, but low potential. And the alpha phase represents low connectedness and high potential. Here's an example that uh, illustrates for, uh, in, uh, uh, the role of the adaptive cycle from a modern society perspective. We can look at the system by, for example, focus on the K phase, the conservation phase. Usually, when we look at modern industrial society, what characterizes the conservation phase is energy gets stored, material accumulates, there is an increasing and in stronger connections in the regulations, a specialist, experts, a technocratic system takes over, are more conservative and efficient, 
systems increasingly stable, become rigid and lose flexibility, increasing dependence on existing structures, as you can say, uh, processes and systems increasing, become strongly vulnerable to disturbances. Then in the possibility of a collapse, we move to the release phase. In this phase, the web breaks, the systems come, comes undone after shock. Resources are released, all kinds of capital resources, social, natural, economic, leaks away. Connections during the collapse break, regulation weakens. Chaotic dynamics, uncertainty, rules, distraction develops. Then we move quickly to the reorganization phase. The distraction shows creative potential, all options open, um, novelty, invention, experimentation becomes possible, release capital can regroup around new opportunities, a uh, phase may or may not end with a new identity, a new basin of attraction, possibly through small changes, events that shape the future. And from there, we move to the growth phase. Uh, in the growth phase, new opportunities and available resources are exploited, weak interaction and weak regulation, pioneers, opportunists are successful, may or may not resemble previous growth stage. So I have been uh, uh, talking this, the, this class from the very beginning about uh, the, 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 the second lecture was about global change and the precariousness of our planet uh, when we talk about the planetary uh, changes, the planetary boundaries. So according to the adaptive cycle, I think uh, we uh, may find ourselves at the moment at the transition between a K to omega uh, uh, state. However, although uh, many people are pessimistic about the future of our planet, if we accept uh, the ideas and insights from the adaptive cycle uh, model, Actually, this is a period of, of great opportunity for renewal, a period in which new experiments uh, will promote novelty and uh, the total renewal of the system. So some uh, from a pessimistic uh, possibility uh, may see the state in which we find uh, ourselves at the moment in, the, in a global scale as a final stage, a, a stage of destruction which is not consistent with the, the, the reorganization phase of the adaptive cycle. So what we need, in my impression, is that we open up to change, we embrace them, instead of trying to control and avoid them, motivated by fear or a tendency to be attached to all the structures. If we open ourselves to change and allow ourselves to go through the cycle to this process, so we can renew our Earth, we can reconnect our communities again. And this is one of the purpose of civic ecology, although operating on a small but significant scale, in my view. The adaptive cycles as a, as a context built within the view of systems thinking is nested. Adaptive cycles are nested in a hierarchy across time and space with uh, integrated overlapping cycles of revolt and remember. This is important to understand. So by remember, I mean, uh, we, we can think of a system that is uh, cycling to this four phase at a certain scale, a certain level. But uh, that system as discussed in the previous episode is always nested within a larger system, which itself has a smaller system nested within it. One a uh, good example that I can find within my own work is in dealing with river basin systems, also called watersheds or catchment. You can see a, a river basin you know, or watershed is an area drained by a river system, by a drainage system. And that river system or that drainage area, which can be the focus of study, is embedded within a larger geographic system, which is the region which, which that uh, basin is in, embedded. On, on the other hand, that basin itself is formed by small tributaries of the mainstream, which themselves are small bases, basins. So the revolt, uh, a good uh, example I can think of to clarify the concepts of re revolt in Remember, is look at this uh, uh, political system, for example. 
a disturbance, for example, a social disturbance can happen at, at the community at a certain level. And uh, if the, the nested system is very uh, uh, rigid, not very flexible, um, like uh, and not very democratic, for example, that disturbance that is initiated at the low level po can propagate all the way up, can cascade all the way up to a process that uh, Holland and Gunderson call revolt. And that, that disturbance that can happen, for example, as illustrated in the figure in the Omega uh, phase, can uh, cascade up all the way to cause the collapse and disturbance of the system at a large scale, at the state level, for example, or at the country level, at the K phase. On the other hand, if it, this is a healthy system in which is, is uh, diverse, uh, is flexible, the system will have the opportunity to influence the disturbance that is happening at a lower level, which is illustrated by the remember. Just uh, going back to that lower level and, in a, in a sense, reminding them what it works and what's right. In this figure here, it's important to note also that smaller and faster levels, like uh, the lower level system, invent, and usually they are fast, they invent, they experiment and test. Large and low, slower levels provide the memory of the past to allow recovery. So again, I was asked here during the interview when we elect, had the first lecture on civic ecology, what was the relevance of a small community approach to global planetary change? This uh, panarchy theory would help, us to, would help me to answer that question because most of the novelty, most of the, the experiments and, and the, the, the new of system actually operates at a faster, lower level. So communities therefore have a great deal, great importance in the renewal of the entire global society. From this perspective, another thing important to know is that no system can be understood or managed by focusing on a single scale. Because of the nestedness of the systems, it's important that in any study, the, you, the, the researcher should at least consider three scales. The focal scale, the scale of uh, interest, and the scale immediately above it, and the scale immediately below it. In civic ecology, again, for us, the focal scale is always a watershed. And then the scale above that is the region in which that watershed is embedded. And the scales below that are the communities of humans, plants, and animals that compose that watershed or ecosystem. In conclusion, I'll just to remind one more time that we live in a complex dynamic world where everything according to systems thinking is connected to everything else. We need better approaches to study, understand, and manage complexity, which from my perspective, uh, uh, systems thinking and complex adaptive systems offer uh, a great opportunity to understand and to better manage this complexity. Complex adaptive systems theory, therefore, offers a powerful new approach to address complex social ecological problems. Central to this approach is the idea that society and the environment in which that society is embedded in, in that sustain us, cannot be treated in isolation from each other as in traditional disciplinary, academic disciplinary approaches. By understanding the broader context in which the challenges lie, we are able to identify sustainable solutions that in turn will lead to improved social ecological health and sustainability. And finally, for your own self-study, I would like to ask you three questions. Question number one, what does the shape and behavior of a flock of birds have in common with a school of fish and a swarm of bees? Secondly, what uh, complex adaptive system attributes contribute to far from equilibrium states, unpredictability in a forest scene, sudden change, changes or surprises in social ecological systems. And third, what does Parnarchy, the model developed by uh, Holling and his collaborators we just discussed, 
the nested cycles of adaptive change can tell us about the future of modern industrial societies. Here I have a list of uh, important work uh, uh, references that you can read to deepen your understanding of systems thinking and complex, uh, complex adaptive systems theory. The first two references by Burks and his collaborators deals with uh, issues associated to the notion introduced in this lecture of social ecological systems. The paper by Gunderson and Harlin is a, a must paper if you want to understand the dynamics of coupled human and natural systems. Kaufman provides further insight into self-organization and evolution in complex systems. Meadows provide an important basic text on systems thinking. And again, I mentioned, I have mentioned uh, previously, but I mentioned his, uh, uh, this here again in this lecture, the work by uh, Peter Vitusek, the American ecologist and his collaborators on assessing the state of the earth in face of human domination. Thank you very much, and I see you next time.